A bulky, middle-aged man sat at the oak table and carefully studied the report. He didn't like what he saw there. The subsidiary company had gone into deficit again, despite the huge investments in its equipment. The man pressed the selector button and called for his secretary. Cindy, tell Antony I want to see him. Five minutes later, a not-so-young, sternly dressed woman walked in. Mr. David, we can't find him anywhere. The man sighed. All right, I'll find it myself. He put on a light jacket, walked to the elevator, and came down from the 35th floor of the business center. A car with a driver was waiting for him at the entrance. After telling the young man the address, the man gloomily stared out the window. He was on his way to see his son and already suspected what he would see there. And so it was. A young girl, barely covered with a tower, opened the door. Who do you want to see? But he didn't answer. Without taking his shoes off, he entered the living room and blushed at what he saw. His son Antony was lying on a huge round bed, sipping cognac from a bottle, and two half-naked nymphs were lying beside him. When he saw his father, he began to dress lazily. Antony, are you out of your mind? Where should you be now? Have you seen the last report? Your company is on the verge of bankruptcy, and you're out here having fun with girls. Come on, Dad. The boy answered with a slurred tongue, struggling to get his foot in his pants. I'm young. I want to have fun. Will this firm melt away? The man looked at his son. He understood that talking to him was useless. Restraining his anger, he clenched his fingers into a fist and quietly, so as not to explode himself, said, That's it, Anthony. You're fired. And walked out. The young driver, seeing that the chief was enraged and rubbing his chest in the heart area, pulled the corvolol from the glove department. Should we go to the hospital, sir? No need, Sam. I'll be fine soon. Pour more drops and give me those red pills over there. Let's go home. His housemaid Lucy greeted him. She got worried when she saw the owner in such a condition, walked him to the couch, covered him with a blanket, and measured his blood pressure. His wife was not at home. She was not often at home. Trying to lead an active social life, Emma was now and then lost at all sorts of presentations, parties, and other social events, where no one did anything but just chatted, got acquainted, and chatted again. He couldn't understand why his wife needed all that. The smart, well-educated Emma was an architect, and a pretty good one indeed. Their mansion had been built to her design and was a huge success. He had met his wife 20 years ago. The young girl turned his head so much that he proposed to her a week after they met. He fell madly in love. She wasn't embarrassed that he was a stranger and she still had a daughter from her first marriage. They lived well together at first, heart to heart. Emma bore him two children and worked even while on maternity leave. They had been through thick and thin together, but thick and thin was not enough, especially when the big money came into the house, the really big money. It was like his wife went crazy. She greedily and fiercely began to make her way into high society sparing neither efforts nor money. David tried to explain to her many times that she was perfect without the approval of all these people, half of whom were swindlers and thieves, yet she wouldn't listen to him. Sighing, David turned off his phones and wrapped himself deeper in his blanket. Lucy, if I fall asleep, do not wake me up for dinner. I'll eat later. I want to sleep for a while. But it did not work. David did not sleep for long when he felt that he was quietly shaken by the hand. Daddy, Daddy, wake up, please. I have a very important thing to talk about. David opened one eye and mumbled sleepily. Is it really important? Yes, Dad. The young girl sat down on the sofa and began fidgeting with impatience, just like a little girl. The new iPhone comes out tomorrow, Dad, and I really need it. I want it so much. There's already a line at the store. Everyone wants to be the first to buy. How much is it, daughter? $1,500, and the same amount to the reseller for the first place in the queue. Seeing her father make a wry face, the girl pouted. You just bought a new phone this month. Why buy another one? I can give you money for iPhone, but $1,500 to the reseller? Stacy, it's just crazy. But you have so much money, Dad. Why are you so greedy? But what do you care if you are the first or tenth who gets the phone? You can't waste money like that, Stacy. Pass all the exams for that semester, and I'll give you the money. 
Why do I need this stupid institute when I'm already rich? Only losers attend lectures there, and they'll think I am if I show up tomorrow without a new phone. Are you doing this on purpose to make me feel bad? The daughter burst into tears and ran out of the room, not even asking why her father had a tenometer and pills on the table. He did not manage to fall asleep again. David was lying awake, staring at the ceiling. Turning on his phone, the man wrinkled his nose. The accountant had called eight times already, and the business partner asked to call him urgently. After listening to the new problems, the man went back to the office. He missed his wife by only an hour. Emmy was 39. The young woman returned home in a gloomy mood. She was out of money again. She and her friend were shopping in a swanky showroom and discussing the latest social gossip. Her friend was richer than her and didn't look at all at the prices when buying the next dress, bracelet, or shoes. It made Emmy feel uncomfortable. Not wanting to lose public face, she bought some pretty handbag without even looking at the price tag, and it wasn't until she looked at the bill at home that she was stunned. It was all her husband had given her for a month, so she called David. He was suddenly angry. Emma, my chief accountant gets as much in six months as you spend in one day. She listened to her husband's infuriated voice. He said that the workshops need new equipment, and Antony missed out on a lucrative contract again. That is why they will spend their vacation not in Ibiza, but in Turkey. Emma threw the bag on the floor in a rage. It was a disaster for her. Taking a sip of cold champagne, the woman sunk into a reverie. David came home late at night. Everyone was already asleep. Only Lucy was sitting in the kitchen. Why are you so late? Did you have a headache again? Come on, let's measure your blood pressure. No need, Lucy. Where is everybody? They've been asleep for about two hours. I'll heat up your supper, and there's some herbal medicine for your heart in the thermos over there. The woman reached for the glass, but the man stopped her. No need, Lucy. I'll pour it myself. Uh, only you take care of me. He took a sip of the hot medicine and listened to the housekeeper nagging at his family. He was so sleepy. He went up the stairs to his room and collapsed on the bed without undressing. The maid, who came in the morning, was surprised to see that he slept in a jacket and pants. Sensing something wrong, the woman began to wake David, but he did not wake up. She began to feel his pulse and then her frightened scream woke up everyone in the house. David woke up in a hospital. All tangled up in wires, he couldn't even move. The girl in white, who was sitting next to him on the chair, tore her gaze away from the book, and seeing that the patient's eyelids were moving, ran out into the corridor and called for the doctor. A man in a green uniform said something to him for a long time. David did not understand half of it, but he realized that it was not his heart. Someone wanted to poison him. The doctor agreed to keep it a secret from everyone, though he tried to call the police. David was in shock. Only his family knew that he was drinking this decoction for his heart. All these days, he was staying in bed. He tried to figure out which one of the family decided to send him to glory. The motive was obvious for him. Money. When clear vision returned to him, he asked the nurse for her phone and dialed the number, which he knew by heart for all these years. Daughter. I'm coming to see you next week, and I really need your help. Of course, Dad. I will help. What can I do? What's the matter? I'll tell you when I see you. After chatting for a few minutes, he hung up. His eldest daughter, Sarah, lived in the neighboring town. When he divorced her mother, the girl was five years old. He immediately left for another city and quickly got married again. But he didn't forget Sarah. He came to see her rarely once every couple of months all because Emma was very jealous of his ex and rolled fierce tantrums when he was going to see the child. Unable to talk sense into the young wife, he began to visit his daughter secretly. At first more often, and then less and less often. Now he had not seen his daughter for six months, but she agreed to help him without hesitating. His wife and children came to visit him in the hospital twice. The first time they seemed very worried but David never understood either his health or the fact that the poisoning could have been revealed. A week later, he was discharged from the hospital. After stopping by the office and entrusting all matters to his deputy, David returned home, and when he was surrounded by his family, he announced that he was leaving. Where are you going, honey? Emma babbled. Did the doctor say that you can do it? I'm going to Tibet today. I want to be alone, in peace and quiet. I've had enough of your antics. My heart can't take it anymore. Dad, how is it possible? 
Antony was distracted from his smartphone. And what about the firm? There were some important contracts, wasn't there? They'll handle it without me. Honey, but we're invited to Smith's, aren't we? The best people in the city will be there. But David just grinned. And what are the best? Emma hesitated. Well, the most famous, the richest. You're sure that this is the best? His wife was silent, and David, having packed his suitcase, left the house and got into a cab. He purposely did not call the driver, so that he would not know that he was not going to the airport, but to a small town where his daughter was waiting for him. She lived alone. As soon as she turned 18, David bought her a separate apartment closer to the university. Walking into the spacious hallway, he looked at his Sarah. The short, slim girl was very much like her father, and she chose the same profession as his, a programmer. Daddy, hi. Oh, you have lost so much weight. Are you okay? Let's go have dinner. I made some soup. I'm fine now. I've just been sick for a while. No, we'll talk about that later. Why don't you tell me how you're doing? I'm fine. Remember, I told you that I got promoted. Well, I'm implementing a new program now. And in fact, I came up with the idea of such a modernization. The girl's eyes lit up. She eagerly told her father about her work asking him questions and offering advice. David was so engrossed in the discussion that he forgot all his problems and sorrows. He recalled himself as a young man, how he opened his own firm and how much he believed in his business and its success. Dad, you're in deep thought, aren't you? Tell me about yourself. You said you needed my help? For work? No, Sarah, it's not about work. Someone close to me betrayed me. And the man told her the story about the poisoning. Sarah was shocked. How could someone do that? It's awful. What do we do now? We have to find out who did it, Sarah. But I don't want to go to the police, so the rumors won't spread around town. Your uncle is a forensic scientist, right? Maybe he can recommend one of the detectives. I'll ask him, Dad. Of course he'll help us. Sarah, that's not the only reason I came here. I can see that you're a good specialist in the IT business. You know a lot. You understand things. I want to pass my subsidiary company on to you. Sarah dropped the glass of tea from her hands in surprise. Dad, are you sure? I'm not that experienced yet. Come on, Sarah. If anything is difficult, I'll help you. And my guys are good experts. You can do it together. You grasp everything in a single flash. You'll be up and running in a couple of months, but you'll have to move. Their conversation turned into a heated discussion. They made plans until late at night, and Sarah, having made her father's bed in the living room, went to her bedroom. She could not sleep at all. All night long, she pondered how abruptly her life was changing. The private detective that Sarah's uncle had advised them arrived the next morning. The mustachioed, stout, rustic-looking man seemed a simpleton, but in fact, he turned out to be very tenacious and experienced. Just by hiring a detective, you will not find out anything. You have to put someone in there. Do you have domestic staff there? He asked David. Yes, we do. A driver, a house manager, a cook, and a maid. There you go. One of them should be replaced by our trusted person. Better the maid. I mean, she's all over the place. And you can arrange surveillance of your wife and children. David agreed with him, but decided to clarify something. Do you have someone who could be the new maid? The detective thought about it for a second. My girls are all busy. I don't even know when they'll be free. A month at best. But I'll try to find someone from my acquaintances. But Sarah interrupted him. Dad, why don't I go there myself as a maid? David grumbled. Will you wash the toilets there and clean the crystal? Well, why not? If I have to quit anyway, I'll hand my business over to the guys, and I'll go to your place in a week. They looked at the detective, waiting to see if he would approve. Why not? Sarah has a point. Just make sure you do not say that you are his daughter, or they will think about poisoning you too. When the man left, David Long tried to talk his daughter out of the idea, but Sarah was adamant. Dad, do you remember how I used to love detectives, and even dreamed that if I was not a programmer, I would be an investigator? Everything will be fine, I promise. So, father had to agree. He called Lucy and warned her that a new maid was coming soon, and whatever she asked and did, Lucy had to help her. Lucy was very surprised, but did not argue. 
So Sarah, carrying letters of recommendation in her purse, kindly composed by Andrew, rang the buzzer in the mansion. Lucy opened it, explained what she had to do and how to do it, and showed her into the maid's room, where a young red-haired girl was already changing her clothes. When they were alone, she introduced herself as Anne and began to instruct the newcomer. Look, just do not clean the son's room, when he may come in, because he will molest. But you do not give in. One has already been fired for this. Miss Emma is in a bad mood in the morning. If she is rude, do not pay attention. If you do not know anything, ask me. Sarah had no sooner stepped out into the corridor than she ran into Stacy. God, who are you anyway? Are you the new cleaning lady? Don't come in before dinner, I'm asleep. Sarah nodded silently and hurried past the girl. She began to clean the living room, but then a young tall guy walked in. He stealthily crept up behind her and painfully pinched her below the waist. Ouch! Sarah jumped forward in surprise and ran into a small table as if by chance there was a vase of flowers. It fell to the floor and the bouquet splintered. The guy laughed mockingly and left the room. The girl began to fix the spoiled quickly. What have you done here? A tall, slim woman rushed to the table, inspecting the vase and cursing at Sarah. Who did you bring to us, Lucy? This silly girl almost broke the vase. Did you take her from the station? She's so crooked. Sorry, Miss Emma, I'll be more careful. Get out of my sight. And Sarah, picking up a rack from the floor, hurried to the basement where she was escorted by Lucy. No sooner had she wiped the already clean floor than a long hissing snake crawled out from under the closet and came right at her. Lucy came running at Sarah's scream. She caught the reptile without fear and explained to Sarah. This is a rare python from Australia, Stacy's favorite pet. He lives in a terrarium but suspiciously often gets out of it, especially when new people come into the house. When the day was finally over, Sarah left for the hotel and collapsed on the bed without energy. It seemed to her that only five minutes passed before the alarm clock rang again. The next day was no better than the last. The mistress of the house was picking on her. Antony tried to ambush her alone again, and Stacy, seeing how Sarah diligently wipes the tiles in the bathroom, advised, If you lick it, it will be cleaner. And smiling evilly, she left. In the evening, Sarah and Lucy walked together to the bus stop, and Sarah could not hide her sadness. Why are they behaving this way with me? It's just the way they are, don't mind them. But I can't. Antony offered me such insane things yesterday. I'm ashamed to even repeat them. I don't get it. He's a young, charming guy. Doesn't he have anyone else to offer that to? He's got plenty of girls. That's not what he wants from you. It's to humiliate you, like they say. If you want to feel good, put the others down. What do they have to feel good about? They haven't even earned their own socks, so they take it out on us, ordinary people. Sarah had been calling her father every day. It had been a week since she'd worked as a maid, but she hadn't heard anything particularly newsworthy. The detective also reported that Emma and the children were leading their usual lives. No unusual behaviors had been noticed with them. The following Saturday, Sarah was to stay at the house overnight to clean up after a big reception. After putting on her uniform, the girl as usual began cleaning the living room. Emma wasn't home and Antony invited his friends over for a little party. The guys got drunk and they were craving some fun. When they saw Sarah, one of the guys asked Antony, Who's that body? I haven't seen her here before. Oh, that's the new maid. My mom hired her. Why does she stink with the rags in here? Did you get laid with her already? Or is she still messing up? Hey, you wretch! He said to Sarah, Don't you want to have some fun? Antony gave his friend a playful slap on the wrist. Are you out of your mind? The right of the first nights belongs to the owner. Don't you know that? Sarah quickly ran to the servant's room. Her face burned with anger and resentment. Somehow, she made it to the end of her shift, hiding from the licentious company as far away as possible. In the evening, Amy, the assistant cook, who was invited before the big parties, came into her room. The girl looked at Sarah in silence, though her eyes were blazing with fire. Amy, why are you looking at me like that? Do you want to tell me something? Why are you making eyes at Antony? Can't you see he's already busy? Busy with whom? 
And what makes you think I'm making eyes at him, that jerk? How dare you call him like that? When I'm the owner of this place, I'll have you out of here in no time. Don't you dare walk past him with your bucket. She turned around, slammed the door, and ran down the stairs. Sarah stood there and did not know what to think. In the evening, she told everything to her father, who told a private detective. Amy was placed under surveillance, and Sarah began to notice that Amy was going into Antony's room quite often. When it happened again, the girl took an empty glass, and in the old godfather's way which Andrew taught her, began to listen to their conversation by leaning the glass against the wall. The more she heard, the more astonished she became. At first came Antony's voice. Of course I'll marry you, baby. Don't you believe me? I do, honey, I do. I'm just tired of pretending to be a cook. Amy, you see, my father survived. And why did I trust you with this concoction? I should have poured it myself. Now, we'll wait for mom to get a new one. But let her pour it herself now. Why should we risk it? When he arrives, we should give him this potion right away. As if he was tired from the road, so he got sick. From there, the couple engaged in each other. More exciting business than conversation. Sarah quickly changed her clothes and ran out of the gate of the house. After catching her breath, she dialed her father's number and she told him everything. It hurt her to tell her father, but surprisingly, he took the news calmly. I had a feeling I was going to hear something like that. Now we have to catch them red-handed. Do you say they're going to poison me again when I get there? Yeah, they're in a hurry for some reason. So I'll send them a message. I'm coming back tomorrow and I'll ask Andrew to strengthen surveillance. Dad, be careful. Don't drink anything when you come back and don't eat. So the father sent his wife a message saying he would be home in a week. Emma wanted to throw a reception in his honor, but the man refused. Still, the detectives following the woman never noticed anything unusual in her behavior. She went where she always went. Then David called Lucy and told her the whole truth. He asked her to stay with Emma all day when he returned. Finally, day X came. In honor of his arrival, the table was overflowing with treats. His wife chirped softly about how much she missed him, and even his son and Tracy ran out to meet him at the gate. They sat down at the table, but the man ate nothing. David, at least try the cake. Amy made it, especially for you. And here is your decoction of the heart. Drink it. You're probably tired from the road. All right, honey, pour a glass. Emma rushed to the thermos. She poured a full glass and handed it to her husband. He took it calmly and sniffed. The smell of sunshine and freedom, like the scent of the Alps. Do you remember, Emma? We rushed there when I got my first profit from the firm. I remember how I slept on a cot in the office for a week just to close the contract and take you to France as soon as possible. I'll pour you a drink. At that moment, he saw the terror in the eyes of his wife and son. David, I do not want to drink yet. Leave it, I'll drink it later. But why? Let's do it together. David held out the glass to his wife, but she was afraid to even take it in his hands. Yet the man insisted, David, I did not want to upset you, but I think I'm allergic to herbs. Put it back on the table. The man froze. He looked into his wife's eyes and did not see in them the loving, cheerful girl she used to be. Where had it all gone? What does money do to people, he thought. David silently poured the tea into a thermos and took it out of the house, where Andrew was waiting for him, and took the tea for examination. When David came back in, Sarah was walking with him. Relatives, if you can call them that, sat at the table in tense silence. You cannot hide. I already know about the poison, but I want to thank you for it. I was on vacation for the first time in 17 years. I went to a museum, to a concert. I just sat in the park looking at flowers. What a blessing it is to just live and not to work like hell for the sake of your showing off. Now I know who's my friend and who isn't. If you care so much about money, I'll leave you everything I have. But don't try to claim the firm. I won't give it to you. This girl, he pointed at Sarah, that's my closest person, and the firm will go to her. Emma wrapped her arms around her head, and Tracy suddenly jumped out of her chair and ran up to Sarah, trying to prick her with the fork hastily grabbed from the table. It was you, you creep, sniffing around. I noticed you at once. 
the way you looked around the house. How dare you bring your girlfriend here? She's the one who gave you the poison, not us. Antony and Emma joined in her shouting. Everyone argued, proving him wrong. Tracy, don't make a scene here. And this is not my lover. Sarah is my daughter. Emma, rolling her eyes and becoming white as a sheet, collapsed. Antony cursed profusely, got a whiskey from the bar, and began to drink straight from the bottle. He looked at his sister and laughed. Tracy, shut your mouth already and go help your mother. And you, he turned to Sarah, you were pretty good at fooling us, and you weren't too shy to wipe up after us, were you? But David answered instead of her. Today, a lawyer will come to see you. He will take care of the divorce and the property, and he will rewrite my will in favor of Sarah. Do you need poison, dear Sarah? Antony said slyly, but no one answered him. Father and Sarah left the house, and getting into the girl's car, drove off to her new company. Sitting in the old Ford, which was tossing on the bumps, David smiled. He felt that for the first time in a long time, he was happy.